Hey everybody, welcome to Sunnyside here, live class online again. Uh, today is a great day in the sunshine. I'm Trevor Cameron, our general manager. So hi to Nicole. Good morning. She's always, got, she's always got the pretty background behind her. I get the pallet wall. So, And Mr. Smith has joined us again, the, the famous Whistling Gardener. He'll be answering your questions on the chat. So give him some hard ones, make him think today. He needs it, the sun's out, right? So thanks again for joining us. Um, this is always a fun class for me. Everybody loves edibles these days, including me. I like my berries, my berry pie, my fresh berries, a little bit of everything berries. Um, it was kind of funny this week. I did a class for the Arboretum uh, at home one night um, and somebody asked me, what's your first memory of working in the garden way back in the day? And of course I passed 50 here a while back. So I'm thinking, you know, it was planting raspberries and blueberries with my mom and dad and then eating them all summer long. So berries always go, go back a long ways for me. Um, you'll see Dr. Lola here. She's hanging over my shoulder. Um, you know, and I want to thank the Ever Clinic. Uh, they're kind enough to sponsor one of our classes a month. Uh, I want to make sure to say it. I said it last month too. This isn't a, a revenue stream for Sunnyside by any means. This is all about you, our customers. So what we've worked out is they donate five fifty dollar gift cards to our customers. I'll give you a really hard question at the end. You have to answer, and then uh, you can try to win one of them and come up here and spend it on some berries. So, so thank you to the Ever Clinic. It's a great community a partner of ours here. You'll see kind of once a month us doing a class with them here on um, in 2022, and we'll see how it goes. But uh, we certainly appreciate them. And uh, Dr. Lowell is an awful nice lady behind me, so I'll say hi to her a few times a day. Um, just a reminder: the class is recorded. You can always go back. Uh, check. I'll be running a slideshow going fast and furious as always. Uh, you can always go back um, and take a look at some things you missed. Um, it'll be up later this afternoon after we do some editing. Um, and then it'll be on our website through our YouTube channel. So hopefully everybody got the handout. I wrote way too much on there as well. Uh, you can access that on our website. Uh, we can email you a copy if you shoot me an email later today. Um, either way, that's a good little reference to give you some good general information on doing some berries. Um, the other thing probably on our web, if you've explored, uh, Nicole does a great job with our website. We've got kind of an info hub. And if you click on the tree and shrub tab and then scroll down to berries, small fruits and berries, you can look at the list of everything that we kind of have around. It's not live, it's not changed. It's kind of our 2022 list of all the things that we have on order that are coming in. Like I said at the beginning, edibles is extremely popular with home gardeners these days. So get up here early, get shopping, get what you need. Um, there won't be nearly as much left uh, when we get towards summer and fall. So you got maximum selection of most everything around uh, right now here at Sunnyside, okay? So give me one second. If I can squint in the sunshine here and see my screen, I'm gonna start my slide, slide show. One second. So, all right. So now we got berries. I've made a fancy border this week. Hopefully you're impressed. I'm playing with PowerPoint. So, so there's me again, if you forgot. And we'll kind of start uh, by talking a little bit about just general growing information. This isn't too specific. We're going to specific uh, berries as we go through the show here, but um, you know, always look for full sun. We're not going to be able to grow most berries in shade where we want at least six hours of daylight and well-drained soil is a must with most everything except blueberries um, is the one you can probably get away with. Uh, I know I live right in Everett and if you look over the Lowell Valley, um, it's underwater most of the winter and there is a blueberry farm with about two bazillion uh, blueberries growing that entire valley on a big U-Pick farm. And so they don't mind being wet but other things we talked about today are gonna to wanna to be well-drained and, and not stay so wet over the winter months. You know, kind of plan out your landscape as far as spacing and air circulation. And we don't wanna crowd these plants too far together. We want good sun, good airflow is gonna lessen our disease, help us with ripening, and frankly, be more attractive in the landscape. Um, you know, watering schedule is always a fun one to talk about here in winter as we don't have to water for probably a few months still, but. But, um, you know, we do get awful dry in the summer and being the typical berry is going to wake up here out of dormancy in March, it's going to bloom, it's going to start to produce and set its fruit for the year. We can't let these plants dry out. So we want to make sure that we watch the water, particularly 
we get into that late May, June, July time frame, depending on which berry we're talking, you know, the first thing a plant's going to do if it gets drought stressed is drop its fruit or berry, then it's going to try to conserve itself for another year and start dropping foliage. So don't, don't let them drop your blueberries on there. Make sure they stay mulched and, and real, real watered. Uh, fertilizer is always a big one. You know, we're all, we're all, all about organics, you know, here at Sunnyside. EB Stone Organics, I think, is the best organic company on the market I've, I've dealt with for almost 30 years now. We carry their full line of fertilizers. There's a couple of great options for berries in our line, just the fruit berry vine food. And if we're talking blueberries, we want something acidic. So we're going to go for the rhododendron food. They got a nice picture of the blueberry cluster on the package now to kind of remind you. You know, mulching is always a big one, especially with bear, with uh, blueberries in particular. You know, I would get on an annual mulching on my blueberries, compost, bark, whatever you do when you feed them here coming out of winter. Let's get the mulch down right away, help conserve the water, keep the roots happy, and again, continue to build the acidity. But it's not just blueberries. You know, I've got strawberry patch, we've got raspberry rose, brambles, whatever. Some mulch is always going to help conserve water and keep those plants happy. We don't want to bury things up the crown, but a nice mulch layer over the root zone is going to really help us when we get into the, to the warmer weather of summer. You know, containers is a big one for me. You know, I'll speak for myself. You know, I got a city yard. I'm about out of space and I like edible things. So what do we do next? We go buy more pots. And so I've got quite a few uh, berries going in containers now on my patio and different areas in the yard. Uh, very easy to grow a number of these things in containers. And, and we'll review some of those as we get into the show. You know, think back to last year, 2021, that I have any issues with my blueberries, with my raspberries, with my grapes, whatever it is. If we want to ensure that we kind of get into the season clean, you know, it's a great time of year here before we start blooming to get a dormant spray down. I brought in, you know, the two that we kind of go by here. We still got plenty after fruit classes, liquid cop and horticultural oil. I can mix those two together in the same sprayer and have a very effective kind of natural defense against bugs and disease. So these can be used in the growing season as well, but this time of year would be a great way. Okay, that kind of had some issues last year. Let's get that sprayed here before we wake back up for spring. Then we know we start 2022 clean and we can monitor it from that point going forward. You know, and, and speaking of sprays, you know, keep in mind, you'll hear in all my classes, I'm always kind of touting organic solutions or natural things to help with issues we may get in our yard with all plants, but particularly with edibles, you know, never get something natural organic. Don't ever use chemicals. Systemics is a no-no. You do not want to eat that stuff as it soaks into the berry or the fruit. So get something natural on there. There's a lot of options, certainly coming down to the store, talking to me or our, our great qualified staff. We'll figure out what your issue is and then find the right, the right uh, product to correct it. Um, now, I'll just mention pruning real quick. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Maybe Steve can hammer them out during class, and at the end, you can ask away. But I want to remind everybody, we kind of kicked off the year this year with a little different twist on our winter pruning class. And we talked about pruning of raspberries and blueberries and grapes and all the things we're going to discuss today um, in that video. So you can access that on our website. The, the class date was January 15th, and that should give you some more diagrams and some more information um, as, as far as uh, pruning here this time of year as well, okay? Um, you know, it's a great time of year to prune. If you haven't done it yet, watch the video or, or come down and talk to me or the staff. It's a great time of year to thin out some of those older blueberries and raspberries and brambles, and we can kind of give you some, some help doing that, okay? Now, if we start off, you know, with the mythical kiwi vine, we'll just start with that as our discussion, um, and then we'll go through here most all the, the, the small fruits and berries. You know, kiwi is a vine. So first of all, we want to give it something to grow on. This isn't a plant we're just going to throw out in the landscape. It'd sprawl out and cover your yard as a ground cover on the ground. You know, we want a trellis, a pergola, a fence, you know, some kind of structure that we can train this on to grow as a nice vine, get it to sunshine and get us to get some good uh, kiwi production as we, as we get full sun. Now, we've always had a multiple different kinds of kiwis you'll see in the pictures up next. But traditionally, kiwi was always a male. We bought a he and we bought a she, and we let the he and the she do their thing, and then we get our kiwis. So this is kind of the last couple of years of a revolution to me in kiwi growing, where you're able to access as a home gardener a lot of new varieties 
that have male, female on the same plant, which is totally different than it's been my whole life. So whether it's fuzzy kiwi or hardy kiwi, the grape or arguta kiwis, we can just buy one plant now, plant it on a, an arbor or a trellis, let it grow and, and we'll get production. You know, a hard, you know, a hard thing with kiwis is, hey, you gotta be patient, give them a few years to get going. And two, I'm sure somebody's already asked in the, the chat, but if you have a kiwi, we have no way to tell you if you have a male or a female until it blooms. And we go back to kind of grade school botany class and we look for pistols or we look for stamens. Do we have a male flower or a female flower? That's the only way we're gonna really be able to tell, okay? So if we look at a couple, just examples, you know, there's Arctic kiwi and fuzzy kiwi. You know, Arctic kiwi to me, yeah, it's got a little kind of grape-sized kiwi. It is delicious, but I think a lot of folks grow that for the foliage. You can see the white, the pink, the green on the variegated leaf. Um, if you grow that, that one can do some shade and not all sun for one, but it makes a really attractive vine and you'll get some small fruits on it as well. You know, fuzzy kiwi is the one we would find typically at the grocery store. Um, you know, I would mention a couple here. Uh, we don't, we'll have them in here pretty quick. One called Sweet and Solo. That's a newer fuzzy one. It just yesterday, the brand brand new one arrived. It's called Jenny. And that's out of the Proven Winners program. And that is another great fuzzy kiwi. Frankly, a zone hardier than, than old fashioned fuzzy kiwi. So a little more durable here in Western Washington. And that would be self-fertile as well. So just one plant needed. The last one are those hardy kiwis. Um, you know, same name that we call that kiwi magic. We don't get much male, female on hardy kiwis anymore. We kind of stick with the kiwi magic that was introduced by Monrovia, a great grower, a lot of folks know. Um, and that's been a good, reliable one here for a few years. And I think down the road, this, is, this has become the standard for, for hardy kiwi. Now, if we jump to blueberries, you know, that's probably the most popular berry. And frankly, the, one of the easiest ones to grow here in Western Washington. Um, you know, just a couple general points to think about when you're doing blueberries. Blueberries love acidity. We have typical acidic for, for soil around here. You can always test your soil with a simple pH meter if you need to. Ideally, we wanna be down, you know, neutral seven. We wanna be kind of in that five to six range is ideal for blueberries. Most of our yards are that anyway, but we can certainly add a little bit of amendments to get to that point if we need to. But if we're gonna feed them, you know, keep the acidity coming. You know, the, the, the bark, the compost is great mulch. We would use a rhododendron food, honestly, um, with the blueberries, that's a great way to get good production, nice growth, but also again, keep that acidity up. Um, I would mulch them every year. You know, I do mine every spring, put my food down this time of year, mulch over the top of it, sweet, I'm good to go. Maybe I go back and feed one more time in that late, in that late May, you know, to June time frame that gets me a nice flush of growth in the summer and a nice wood for the production for 2023 at that point. So, so keep an eye on the food. I would try to get them at least twice a year would be ideal. You know, like I mentioned earlier, blueberries don't mind being wet. So, you know, I'm not gonna plant them in a swamp. I'm not gonna dig a pond and do it that way. But if you have some areas in your yard that maybe are a little bit wetter in the winter in particular, you know, blueberries is probably a plant that would be fairly easy to grow in those things. Um, you know, keep in mind with blueberries, we've got a lot of evergreen, semi-evergreen options now, and we still have old school, you pick northern high bush blueberries. You know, if you want a big old six foot bush, heavy crop, you still can't beat northern high bush varieties. They get fabulous fall color too. That's a real pretty plant in the fall. Um, you know, always keep in mind with the high bush in particular, you know, we want to plant more than one variety for best production. If you want to maximize your crop, which I would always want the most berries I can find, you know, plant two varieties, let the bees do their thing and cross pollinate your two. You're going to have better crops on both of them. You know, on that, on the, on the slide there, you'll see the E, the M and the L early, mid, late. If you look on our list or you come down to shop here at Sunnyside, you'll see our high bush varieties classified in those three categories. We have to get the, the same season or the adjacent season is okay, and we'll get the pollinization we want. Early with late is taking a huge chance, but early with mid or mid with late, you tend to be okay. Um, and you've got a lot of options. We've probably got 15 different high bush ones down here that you can kind of mix and match depending on if you like flavor, a little bigger berry, a little smaller berry, 
you know, kind of whatever your personal taste is as well. Um, you know, you'll see in the pictures here, a lot of new hybrids coming out. Uh, the main thing is the bushel and berry program. You'll see a bunch of those, but this is what I have growing in some pots on my patio, one called jelly bean. You'll see um, very easy to grow, a little bit smaller structure on a lot of them. Some of them, not the biggest berries in the world, but you know, I don't think that's, that that's a bad thing. You know, to me, the bigger the berry, sometimes a little mealy, not as much flavor. We get kind of a nice smaller, medium-sized one. The flavor is much more complex, a little bit sweeter, um, and I think a little better flavor. So, so uh, certainly something to consider as well. If you are going to do them in pots, again, going back to that acidic, keep them in acidic potting soil. You know, I I swapped mine from using our regular Edna's Best a great organic potting soil for flowers and everything else. It, my blueberries weren't thriving when I had them planted in that. When I went to the, the acid potting soil, their acid mixture for rhodes, azaleas, camellias, and blueberries, that's something I can use as an amendment, mixing in with my soil to improve that. Or if I'm in a container, I can use that as a straight potting mix. And my things doubled in production the first year that I swapped. When I transplanted them, I used that soil and I've had much better luck for a number of years since then, okay? And then again, we've had, you know, we got kind of a little nippy here in our neck of the woods after, after Christmas for a couple of weeks. Everybody remembers the snowmageddon right at the New Year's, um, you know, but typically on most winters, a lot of these new ones I'll show you from Bushel and Berry are going to stay at least partially evergreen and have some color in the wintertime. Then we get to spring, the old foliage drops, they leaf back out, start blooming, and then off we go for another season. Now there's the bushel and berry, you know, new varieties come out every year. Like I mentioned, most of them evergreen or semi evergreen. This is a great one to consider for, for containers. And again, I don't want to say don't grow them in the yard, being a little more attractive with foliage color and smaller stature. You know, a lot of these make great hedges, you know, instead of boxwood or a nice specimen plant mixed in with the yard. Um, you know, versus just, oh, let's the plant a berry patch against the fence and kind of keep them separate. A lot of these, I think, would be attractive shrubs that you get to eat something on too. You get kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and even some new trailing ones. You know, we got the first few of these last year, but Midnight Cascade and Sapphire Cascade, you'll see in the pictures, um, kind of hang a little bit. They're kind of fun where you could put them in a container or raise them up off the ground in a, in a cool hanging basket and be able to reach up and pluck some fresh berries in the summer as well. They've got, they've got excellent quality berries. So if we look at a few kind of our staples um, on blueberries, you know, kind of for a number of years, the, the two standards, these first two have been our most popular sellers. Bountiful Blue um, is from Monrovia. Um, that's a great producer, a little bit smaller size plant, maybe three, three and a half feet, bushier. This is one that again, I think would look nice in the landscape let alone, you know, putting it in a separate area and it's not going to overpower the garden. They got great berries on them, but a nice uh, medium sized plant, a little bit easier care. And then Sunshine Blue is the partner one. Ideally, we try to have somebody take home Bountiful and Sunshine and plant those both in the landscape. Then we've got two quality blueberries that again will cross pollinate a little more and, and increase our production. We would call those partially self fertile. If you just had one, yes, you will get some berries on it. Um, but if you want to, again, maximize your crop, having two is always ideal. So get two different ones to kind of go together. Now, if we look at, these are some bushel and berry ones here. So if we look at some of the foliages, again, the colors are outstanding and they have great berries. So pink icing has been a really nice one. That's got a lot of pinky growth on it in spring. It's kind of a turquoisey purple color in the winter times, very attractive as well. Jelly bean is the one I chose a number of years ago to put in the pots on my patio. We get a great crop on it on a small plant. You know, mine's about 10 years old now. I've never sheared it or pruned it. I've thinned it out a little bit, but I haven't cut it back. And I might have about a two foot by two foot plant here. And I get a lot of berries off that plant. So nice and bushy, um, heavy bloomer, but a really easy one to grow in the yard um, or in the containers. Silver Dollar is a new one last year. We got a bunch this year. Again, kind of like the pink icing, I think a really attractive looking plant. Um, they called that Silver Dollar. It almost has kind of a silvery, almost eucalyptus kind of look to the leaves, but a good quality berry, again, on a very tidy plant. That's just gonna be in that two to three foot range. 
and something again I can use in the yard, even clip as a little hedge or use it as a container plant. And blueberry buckle. Now this is one I picked up one last year too. Um, I like some small blueberries with some crazy flavor. And this is kind of a little closer to what I would call a native blueberry, where maybe I'm a little darker blue black color. You can see from that picture, a lot of small berries. Yes, I got to kind of break them into a pile, put them on the ice cream, the, the, the cereal, whatever you like. But the flavor is excellent on a lot of these. So blueberry buckle, very small plant. This would look a lot like boxwood. Again, I've had some customers even last year plant these and, and use them as a boxwood substitute um, or something they can eat as well in the yard. And then here's your trailer. So I think these were kind of fun. We got, we had a few last year. We got a bunch just came in yesterday, but we have Midnight Cascade and we have Sapphire Cascade. And you can see kind of the nice quality berries, but also kind of growing them somewhere different. I mean, how fun is that? You know, the, the friend gardening friend comes over and says, what is that growing in your hanging basket? What's well, a new blueberry I found. So there are some, some nice trailing ones as well. They'll get a little shrubby, but they kind of arch out and then hang back down. So it does look nice and attractive in a basket. And so here's some fun ones. Now we get kind of past the, the new hybrids and these are some of the old hybrid types. And these are, I think, some of the more unique ones. Like I mentioned, we carry a lot of varieties of highbush blueberry, um, but these were two kind of fun ones. You know, I, the, the pink popcorn's a good storyteller. You know, you think blueberries are always blue, try pink. You know, pink blueberries are kind of fun. You got a fruit salad going, you know, or something fun in the summer when you're picking them. It's like, what is that? You got pink blueberries in there. They taste the same. They just don't look the same. So it's kind of fun to, to mix up the colors a little bit. Pink popcorn uh, would give you the pink color and be a nice little high bush variety. A uh, Raz is another one we like here. It's been out for a few years now. Um, believe it or not, they call it Raz because it kind of has the, the taste of a raspberry mixed with the blueberry. So kind of a fun one uh, for fresh eating if you like a little different flavor. Um, here's a couple I would mention in particular. Now bonus is one I found, la we had it last year for the first time. We just got a bunch of these in again. You know, if you are a blueberry farmer or you want maximum production, get a bonus that would be one that should be in your mix for sure that is the record holder for pounds per, per bush um, all over the country this was found up in the upper midwest it's very hardy um, but this is one i think you're up in the 14 pound range on a nice size bush for a you know for a pick farm or a home gardener that's a lot of blueberries so this is one if you want to maximize your your crop i would mix a bonus in there too that, that's got a terrible name if you ask me but but uh, that one gives you a lot of berries on them, okay? Um, Cabernet Splash is one I put on just because it's kind of fun. It, it, I didn't show the berries on it. It's got a great berry, but that's got a cool foliage. You know, we've talked a lot about mixing these into the landscape, kind of an edible landscape area that I can, I'm out weeding and I can grab a stack here and there in the summertime. You know, Cabernet would give you some really good foliage color. That's a picture taken in spring. It gets great color in the fall again but that's another high bush variety. It's a little different just because of the foliage. Now, if we talk raspberries here for a minute, um, you know, raspberries are one of my favorites. I know most of them are prickly and you gotta get some body armor on to get in there and pick a little bit, but, but uh, if you're careful, this is a, a great way to, to eat fresh berries most of the summer into fall if we pick the right ones. You know, consider raspberries really in, in two types. We're gonna have June bearing, and then we've got what we call ever bearing. And essentially that just means if I'm a raspberry, if I only bloom and produce on old wood from the year before, then I'm, then I'm a June bearer. So I can't prune those back in the winter. You'll get no crop. You wanna prune those after blooming or after picking um, to, to keep them tame and, and size. We can always go in and remove some of the oldest wood right at the base at the ground level but we're, we're not gonna cut these back as much this time of year. This would be more of a summer project. I wanna enjoy, maximize my crop, and then I can turn around and do my pruning and I'm ready to go for the next season again. Everbearing produces in June on the old wood, and then all that growth that comes up starting in spring, that will bloom and I get to pick a little bit more late summer, early fall, depending on your variety, they've got a little bit different times. But if, you know, if I'm a fresh garden eater, I tend to go for everbearing. You know, I want to walk out as much as I can, 
and pick some fresh raspberries early summer, late summer, fall. If I'm maybe canning or jamming or doing something, freezing them for later, maybe I wanna do some June and just pick one big crop, save them, and then I'll see you again next year kind of thing. So, you know, talking to customers, you know, I think a lot of people do a little of both. You know, if I was going to give you a, a recommendation for me, I'd probably do two thirds, you know, ever bearing, one third June bearing. You get a nice big crop to start the summer off with the June. And then I've got a little bit to keep me going here over the, the later summer fall as well. Okay. Now, with raspberries, the opposite is going to be the, than blueberries. We don't want these wet. The people that struggle with raspberries, bring me samples in, send pictures. It's almost always problems with air circulation because they don't prune or the ground is a heavy clay and too wet in the wintertime. Raspberries have to have good drainage. So, you know, make sure where you plant your rows and set up your patch that we do have good drainage down a foot and a half, two feet would be great. Raspberries get a lot of root systems. If you've had them, you're kind of smiling going, yeah, I know I planted one and 18 of them came up all over the root system pretty quick. Um, Cause that's how they grow. You know, that's how raspberry is going to grow. It's going to suffer by the root system to give me another cane that I can continue to develop my structure and get more production down the road. Okay. You know, I would set up a, you know, a T post or something to grow them on. You can have rows, you know, maybe if I did mine again, maybe I think about putting bamboo barrier or some kind of edge in that will keep them from running too far. Um, but that's not necessary. I, I think most people I've seen now, you know, even just get a, a, a simple treated wood or a curbing that kind of sets that bed apart from the yard. Yes, it'll help keep the, the, the row contained a little bit, but it gives me an edge to kind of keep it a little tidier. Um, so remember pruning, if you again watch that video, I put some diagrams up on that one we did in mid-January, but, you know, really figure out if you have that June bearing or ever bearing, and then we would attack the pruning accordingly. Now to show you a few raspberries and, and you're gonna see what's, what's that parenthesis. So I remembered this year because everybody tried to ask me what was what. So if you see a J in parentheses after the name here, that means that's a June bearing variety. If I see an E in parentheses, that means I'm gonna have an ever bearing variety. So we made this real easy. So raspberry shortcake is the one unique creature out there. We just got a bunch in that is thornless. First of all, and I'll say that again, thornless, so you don't have to bleed when you pick them. So that's a short grower, just a couple feet tall. It's still a raspberry. It spreads and it throws new canes up. But I'm going to get a good quality berry in June. I don't have any kind of re-blooming re and reproduction on it. So that's a one cropper. But this has been a real popular choice for a lot of people with smaller landscapes. This is one that you could grow in a pot for a long time. You know, we had them growing here in containers about five, you know, you know, say an 18 inch, two foot pot, five years go by, they're root bound. We tip it over in the winter and we chop it into quarters. Now we got four pots of raspberries, you know, and off we can go again. So a very easy one to grow with good quality berries that is thornless and nice and short if you want something dwarf. Now, if we get into regular, <coughs> you know, upright growing ones, you know, here's a couple that show you, we get more than these, but here's a few options you'll find out right now you know fall gold is an interesting color first of all with the gold it's really sweet that's a heavy sugar one and that's one that always is late so maybe i'm not as interested in the june early july but i'd like to be picking some some nice sweet golden raspberries more on that august september time frame you know that's going to be a late one so not repeat necessarily but a little bit later crop heritage is a great old school red one easy one to grow over here and that's an ever bearing. So if I want again that June and then repick in the fall, that would be a great choice for that. Uh, Willamette, you know, you can tell local here, Northwest raspberry, that is still the number one raspberry planted in the entire world, let alone the Pacific Northwest. That is the go-to one for any you pick farm. That's a great quality berry that's just June, but that's got great quality berry with good flavor. And, and again, a great Northwest variety, really one, easy one to grow. Canby is another one from Oregon, a little bit larger berry maybe on Canby than most. And that one is a little less thorns. If you're, if you're worried about the thorns on the canes, that one's not thornless, but it does have a little bit less than most. And that's another good June one. 
<clears throat> I'm, I'm really psyched our local grower started carrying some good local varieties. You can tell by the name there. I was Cascade Premier and Cascade Harvest. And sometimes we even get Cascade Gold if we can find it. You know, these are local ones. This is right here, Western Washington, easy to grow. You know, probably the one thing I would say about these, you know, excellent quality berries, but maybe a little bit more disease resistant. If you've struggled maybe with some of the ones that may be a little too wet, you know, whatever the issue is, these might be a little more fail safe. They are again bred right here, a little bit better for our, for our specific little microclimate here in Western Washington. Uh, Crimson Night is one uh, I've had before. That's another one, a little darker red berry. I think that, and the last one I'll show you here in a minute are at the top of my ever bearing list. I think that's a really good quality ever bearing raspberry, great flavor, a little darker blackish red color to it. Um, but that one I think you'd be real happy with as, a, as an ever bearing option. We just got those in as well. Um, Encore um, is again a newer one, a little bit more again, Western Washington climate. That's a June bearing, uh, maybe as a, as a substitute for Willamette. And the last one there, Indian Summer, that's always been one of my favorites. Um, I think there's really good ever bearing ones, but I, I don't think you'd ever lose with Indian Summer. That's one we probably sell more than any other at this point. Um, and if I want that two crops a year, that would be a great option for you. Um, we, we do have some Indian summer going. Now, if we talk about other brambles here for a second, let me make sure if I'm going to do good on time. Um, you know, if we're looking at other brambles, you know, raspberries are a kind of bramble too, but we'll look at other ones. You know, it kind of sounds funny as people are trying to eradicate blackberries from their uh, hillsides and yards as they invade in. Uh, this is not, the, first of all, the blackberry we have is not even native here. It's Himalayan blackberry. Um, and this is more gourmet. When we talk about nicer blackberries, there's a reason. They got a bigger bigger berry, nicer fruit, a little bit more manageable, um, and certainly useful to use in the yard if you like blackberries like I do. So uh, boysenberry is the first one there. And that we do that thornless. So again, I don't have to body armor up to go pick it. That's a thornless one that we always have around. We've got some of those ready to go. A Little bit bigger than a blackberry. I like a little tang in my berries. So that would be the way I'd go. I like my poison berries and marion berries and some of those others. Uh, Tayberry has been a hard one to find. We're trying to find some again for this year. That's our blackberry raspberry cross. And if you like, again, a a little tang with the sweet. That's a big berry. Uh, that's a really nice one, fresh eating too. I'm getting hungry here. Hold on, I need to get get some berries. Um, you know, Marion blackberries. I mentioned if I had one gift on earth, it would be the Marion berry pie. I'd take that every single day. So there's my there's my weakness. My mom grows me some wonderful Marion berry pies every year. Thanks, mom. She's ever watching here. Uh, Primark Freedom is a newer one, and again, you know. All these brambles we're talking about, it, it's, it's about what we call floricanes and primacanes. We don't wanna make this too complicated and try to get you a botany lesson in the day. But if we look at those two types of wood, we got blooming wood and we have fruiting wood. So one year old wood is what I will get bloom and production on. If I picked it last year, you're useless to me, you cut it out. So that's the game with brambles is we go out there and we cut out what we picked last year that's got the little dead flower clusters on it and leave the one-year-old wood and we can keep these things much more maintained that way. Um, this is a plant, you don't, it won't never get as tall as blackberry, but we want something to kind of lay the canes on and make it easier to pick. So maybe it's a four foot, you know, T-post with a couple of simple wires that we can kind of get our plants trained out on to get them sawn, to make it easier to pick and keep them contained a little bit. And if we do the right pruning, you know, it's never going to turn into the mess that you see on the roadsides around here with those Himalayan blackberries. We can keep these much tidier in the landscape, you know, as part of kind of the home edible garden. The last one there, the reason I brought up the whole Floricane Primacane is because that's the one that's different. So Primark Freedom uh, came out of the South. We've carried this now a couple of years. That is the only blackberry that I know of that you're going to get fruiting on both woods. So if I want to double my crop and kind of go the ever bearing raspberry route, I can get berries, blooming berries on last year's growth in early summer. And then what grows during that spring summer, I will have a second crop to pick in the fall. 
So if you wanted to kind of get a little extra blackberries going, if you like them like me and the pies and the ice cream and the rest, you know, maybe try Primark Freedom. That's one that's thornless, so we won't bleed. And again, I get the double crop on that. It's a little bit different than the other ones. Now, if I mention a couple, you know, other berries, and I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect these two, but sometimes folks kind of go for those big hitters that we've started with. Um, there's a lot of good berries to grow. I mean, I'm sure there's people typing and asking Steve or all about all kinds of other things that we won't even mention in this class, but but uh, certainly there's a lot of fun berries. Goji berry, you know, is one of those super fruits. You know, if you read online, well, goji berry will fix all the, all the ails in your body if you eat them regularly, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, we do have some goji berries in stock. That's a self-fertile plant. I don't have to worry about getting a second variety. Um, it is a pretty good sized bush, give it some room to grow. And that one we would want absolutely drainage and absolutely full sun. So make sure we don't cram that into the shade and we don't have that clay layer down there. We want to make sure that's uh, got great sun and good drainage as well. Uh, honey berries, I've seen these called has gaps. There's all kinds of names for them. You know, typically you'll see these on the, the hotter, drier side, Eastern Washington. This is a plant that would be native up into the plains in Canada. Super cold hardy, super drought tolerant, loves the heat. Um, they do fine here in Western Washington as well. I've got a number of friends that have them and I've seen them growing all over. Um, just watch again, the sun and the air circulation. The problem with honeyberry around here would be maybe a touch of mildew. It never tends to affect the fruiting of it, to be honest, but the foliage maybe not look so bad if, if we're too, too shady or too wet. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And keep in mind on the honeyberries that we have to have two different varieties that bloom at the same time so when you come down we've got a few in we've got some more coming uh check your varieties ask the staff do some research and make sure you get two that cross pollinate with each other we, nothing's more disappointing than buying two plants and getting no production off them so make sure we get the right two to go together you know honeyberries you can get some shorter ones there's some big old bushy ones too so you can kind of pick your you know three four maybe five foot tall or we can go some big old massive ones up there, seven, eight, nine feet, if we want to get some bigger growers. We tend to, to stay towards the shorter side here at Sunnyside. Now, if we look at grapes real quick, you know, kind of the first one we looked at was kiwi. This is another, you know, vine. You know, we, we got wineries around here. We got fresh grapes. We got grapes a little bit everywhere, both west and east of the mountains here in Washington. Um, you know, for us, you know, I'm not going to get into talking about how to make wine and how to make juice and we can find all that on the internet or come down and ask, but we're going for table grapes. You know, I want slip skin, seedless grapes that we can sell you folks as a home gardener to go home. You go out, the kids go out, snack on some fresh grapes when they're ripe and have good success doing that. We don't need to get to, too crazy. So a lot of the ones we'll have, we got a pretty good selection in already, which is unusual. Grapes have been real hard to find uh, for a number of years. And we do have some more coming in still too, but we have a lot of these in stock now. You know, hemrod and interlocking would be towards the top of my list if you wanted a good green, you know, seedless grape, great flavor, easy to grow um, as an option. If you wanted to get something a little darker, again, we've got other ones that are good out there, but Suffolk's a great red one. Uh, Black Manuka is one we don't have in yet, but we'll have here pretty shortly. Those we get grown. Uh, by one of our local growers, um, but there's certainly some great options. We've got lots of other ones out there. Um, again, I'm excited with the grapes as we see more, you know, Western Washington specific uh, varieties come in here. A lot of folks call or email. I'm looking for Thompson seedless and this and that. And it's like, okay, we got to move to, you know, Northern California, Southern California, some different climates to grow a lot of those successfully. So if we stick with our or good tried and true Western Washington ones will have much more success. Now, <clears throat> again, I'm kind of, I like my blueberries, but if we kind of go back to that vaccinium, we call a family, the blueberries are part of this family as well. You know, we can get a lot of really fun other berries that are, are a little bit like blueberries. You know, box huckleberry um, is a common name. It's Gallusacea. We call it buried treasure, not like the pirate, but like B R R. I.E.D. buried treasure, um, you know, that's a great low, 
native type huckleberry that grows more in the Appalachian region, not so much on the West Coast, it does great here too. But if I was looking for an evergreen low plant that I think is really attractive anyway, then you throw some small little delicious huckleberries on there as well, then we got the best of both worlds. So a uh, gall eusacea or box honeysuckle would be an excellent ad addition to kind of the native garden. Um, it's a little evergreen, kind of more of a ground cover, not going to get too tall at all, but, but spread a little bit and, and be a nice tidy little, little shrublet, we'll call it, a little bit shorter. Uh, lingonberry is exactly the same way. If we go, you know, to most of Europe, especially up in Scandinavia, we got some lots of lingonberry lovers. You know, vaccinium uh, lingonberry is another really easy plant to grow. It's evergreen. It's low, like less than a foot tall. You know, not it's kind of a ground cover, but it's not super crazy invasive ground cover. So it's a nice lower plant that we can use in the landscape, get some delicious lingonberries off of, and it can have, I think, an attractive shrublet you know, with some green foliage all year, a little bit of winter color on it. Uh, this is another one we've, we've got a bunch in right now. Now, if we go to Pacific Northwest native, there's our two, you know, evergreen huckleberry, vaccinium ovatum. You'll see this growing everywhere. Sun, parche in the woods, the ditch, a little bit everywhere. Uh, you know, evergreen huckleberry is one of my favorites. I like a little huckleberry slump from a local restaurant here. That's a great little small, you know, dark blue blackberry with great flavor, but that would be evergreen. So again, looks nice to me in the landscape. And I get to pick some berries late summer, fall on that as well. Um, and I, I've got a red huckleberry in my yard. These are a little more sour, not quite as sweet. Um, I love them as well, but this is the one we would see, you know, if we're out for a little hike out in the woods here, you see the old nurse logs or the old stumps that have hollowed out. And what's that growing out of the middle of it? It's almost always a a red huckleberry has found its way in there. Um, this has been a really hard plant to find. If you've been searching these out, I uh, will say get yourself down to Sunnyside soon. Um, I sequestered 200 of them in the fall. We stashed them and hoarded them like proper nursery people here. So we got a bunch of red huckleberry now. I'll tell you when they're gone, they're gone. And I don't know when we'll find them again. This has been a really hard plant to find. Uh, for a number of years now, but we got a bunch of red huckleberries in stock at the moment. Now, strawberries, we get pretty close. Strawberries here would be the last one. So, um, you know, strawberries are one easy to grow here in the Northwest. Um, you know, we don't have them in quite yet, except for a couple I'll mention here in the slides. A um, little later in February to early March, we will start to have a great selection of strawberries, uh, both again, June bearing or ever bearing. So you'll see those same thing as the raspberries. When I show you varieties here, E means I'm gonna have a consistent crop to pick all June through the fall. The June bearing ones, again, maybe I'm freezing them, jamming them, you know, hoarding them in my freezer. You know, I can pick a bunch, bag them and save them that way and, and just pick one time. So there's some good ones on both of them. Um, you know, Albion's a nice ever bearing one we'll have in here pretty quick. Uh, Shuckson's a great local Western Washington June bearing one that we would have in. A uh, raspy berry is one we just got yesterday. Um, that's got kind of a funny name. It's not the hugest berry in the world, but they are delicious. That's going to give you the flavor of, again, a little bit of raspberry, a little different flavor with that strawberry in there. That's kind of a fun one to grow. Uh, Seascape is another one. We sell bazillions of Seascape. That is an excellent ever bearing variety. And then kind of on the new side, we just got both these in. Uh, we had a, a small chunk of these last year. They were hard to come by this year. We'll have bazillions of them. Um, these are out of that bushel and berry program, kind of like the blueberry, um, where they're breeding for a little bit different plants in the landscape. You can see the pictures there, hanging baskets, strawberry pots. I can use them in the landscape as a ground cover, the same as other ones. But this is a really interesting flower. You can see scarlet bell would have a bright red double flower on it. Really pretty, I think, to look at. And then I get a berry on it as well. And then Rosy Bell would have that double pink flower. Same idea, a little bit different look for strawberries. So great quality berries, but I think maybe the most attractive of the plants were the flowers on top of that. So maybe in a hanging basket would look really nice to, to try one out. Now, just a couple last things we'll mention here and we'll do some questions. You know, gooseberries, uh, we do get some in a little bit later, but if you like your old school gooseberry, that's still an option. 
Um, we do get some currants in. We don't do them bare root anymore. Uh, so these will be coming in uh, grown for us here a little later this month, early March. We can do white currants, black currants, red currants. We will have all three colors in. And then there you go. So on the last slide there, I try to always put our web address. You can find the berry list I mentioned on there. The class handout will be on there. All of our upcoming classes and events. Uh, lots of good information in the info hub. And then if you want to email us, you know, feel free. You got Sunnyside Nursery at MSN.com there. And that is one you can reach me or the rest of the staff anytime. Uh, we're always emailing people these days. So certainly send a picture, ask your question, um, whatever you like. And um, that's an easy way to access us by email as well. Okay. So let me stop my share here through a couple of logistics things. Um, so again, Dr. Lola's here hanging next to me. I, I like Lola these days. She starts singing LOA Lola, right? The kink song. Someone was probably singing that in the background. But uh, Dr. Lola, thank you for helping us out. This is a really cool thing, I think, for our customers to jump on a class, hopefully learn a little bit of information from me, get a gift certificate if you're one of the lucky winners or a gift card, and then come down here and be able to do some shopping. So uh, today is all about sunshine as I'm squinting here through the greenhouse roof. We have fabulous weather this weekend. The, the nursery was busy yesterday. There's a lot of the berries in stock. I'd really tell you to get, get down here today or tomorrow, do some shopping. We got a great selection. Um, you know, with the classes, we always put stuff on sale. So all berries, 20% off. You come down here, tell the cashier I was at Trevor's class. I listened to him bore me for an hour. They hit the button on the register. You got 20% on your purchase. So, so take advantage of the 20% sale and the fertilizer. You know, soil and, and food is always the key to growing anything successfully. So we put both on special. I got rhododendron food. And if you see now, they actually put the cluster of blueberries on there to remind me and you, this is what we want for our blueberries. And then we have fruit berry vine food that's got everything, grapes and fruits and, and berries and everything on there. So those are your two go-to fertilizers. Those are the four pound bags. If you have a bunch, we've got 15 pound large bags of both of those as well. Great from EB Stone. Those are also 20% off as well. So take advantage of both those sales. Um, so let's see, gift card time. So should I do the question here? Well, before we do that, let me just say, if you're not tired of listening to me, jump on tomorrow at 11 a.m. We have Rose class tomorrow. So this is always a fun one. Valentine's Day is on Monday. So we always do our first rose class right around Valentine's weekend. So I can try to talk you into buying your sweetie a rose bush versus trying to go get a dozen flowers. They're going to die in a week. So turning tomorrow at 11, we'll talk everything about roses, the new roses for this year, how to take care of them, how to grow them great. And then off we go for, for another good rose year as well. So, so let's do the gift card question. So I don't know how she's, are you going to pick random chat people to answer this correctly again? Yeah, we're going to go random because every time I do the fastest, I know not everybody is, you know, the same kind of technology savvy. So we're going to go random um, and they'll, you know, to the best of my memory, be different than the last ones. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to go random. So don't panic. The sooner the better, but we're not going to do the first five. So. <laughs> well, and I'll say this. I don't type very fast either. So don't feel guilty. And B, you know, please do this if you're local you know i know we've got some some nice folks that join us from other areas and i've gotten emails from everywhere from chelsea england to this place and australia and all over the place doing the zoom thing but you can't spend the gift card if you're there so so do it if you're local here and you're actually going to come up to the store okay so here's the question i think last last month's question was too easy it was mr mason b so i tried to make it a little harder we'll see if you're paying attention but this is kind of an interesting one. What other color besides blue do blueberries come in? We'll see how fast they can type it. There you go. <laughs> so we'll let Nicole, she'll probably notify everybody there. Um, you know, who's the, who's the lucky winner? Thank you to Steve for coming in. Hopefully you guys gave him some hard questions here today. Um, and again, the sun is out. So let's come down here. Hopefully we'll see you down here today. I'll be out working all weekend. Uh, we've got some great staff down to help you as well. So. We have some more questions or does Steve get them off? 
Well, uh, he's definitely been typing very quickly. There's been lots of them and you guys have had really great questions. So um, it's good. And, and hopefully you can see them when they pop up so you can see kind of what everybody else has been asking and maybe that answers some of your questions. Um, but it's the same question that always pops up about if we are gonna grow things in containers, how do we choose the right container? How do we know? How do we know how long they can last? It's, you know, it's a good, interesting question. It is. A, it's a great one. And again, it's going to depend on the plant. You know, you, you saw me mention the raspberry example. You know, that's all about root system growth. I'm not going to be able to grow that in a little pot for very long. Um, so let's start with this. We'll try to go the opposite direction this time as we explain it. If I have a container with a berry this time of year right now, I'm ending the time frame for transplant, dividing and all that stuff. So here late winter, I walk out there and I take my fingers and I try to stick them down the edge of the container, the inside edge. If I can't get my fingers in there and I'm feeling a solid circular root system, it's probably time that I need to up plant that larger container, divide it if it's the raspberry, move it to the landscape, buy another one. That's what I usually do um, either way. So that's phase one. I would also ask last summer when you were out watering this plant in the container, what happened? Did the water flush right through the soil? There was no soil left, it was all roots. Did it struggle even though you watered? If, if we're all root bound in there, that's what's gonna happen as well. So that's an easy choice to say, yes, let's get that up shifted. Now, if we're talking about starting the choice right now, I'm, you're coming down here today, Trevor, I wanna grow some blueberries in pots like you talked about, what do I do? So I started with about a two foot pot, you know, something like two by two, if I like glazed, you know, fancy schmancy outdoor frost proof glazed. You know, that's my thing. I don't ever want to replace it. I can use it for something. We could do plastic, you can do wood. Don't do terracotta, they'll break in the winter, but but I don't really care what, what pot it is. Whiskey barrel's fine. I mean, it could be anything. The bigger it is, the longer I'm gonna last. You know, some people won't have room for 20 whiskey barrels sitting on their patio and I would raise my hand for that. So I went something two by two. That probably lasts me on a blueberry like I have you know, it was six, seven, eight years before I was like, okay, it's time for you to go into a, a larger permanent home. My pot's still a little deeper. It was a little wider. It might be about a 26, 28 inches wide, maybe 30 inches deep. And I don't think I'll ever have to worry about much after that. And that was about three, four years ago. Again, using the right soil as part of that too. Make sure you get the acidic type planting mix for the blueberries everything else we would use Edna's best potting soil, just a really good organic potting soil, okay? So I don't know if that helps. I mean, it's, you know, it, I would always go for frost proof. We got cold, you know, if you had a cheap glazed pot or even plastic, I hate to say it, it might've cracked and broke, you know, in the cold weather we have. Nobody wants to redo this every year. So if we get a nice sized, you know, frost, frost proof glazed container, pick your color, your style, you know, do your own thing with that. I like orange, so mine are in orange ones. Um, you know, pick pick your own pot out and grow. But if, if as a general rule, I would say if you've got something, you know, 18 inches to two foot wide, you know, 18 two foot deep to start with, now we've got probably four or five, six, seven, maybe eight years, depending on the plant, to keep it happy. Then we can go into something a little bit larger down the road. Very helpful. Um, we have lots of questions about strawberries. Um, how long do you know, I mean, how long do they last? How many yeah. years can you expect? Does that depend on variety? Yeah, it, it, that's a great question because I, I did, it's hard to do this all in 45 minutes. And I thought, I don't know how much I want to talk, you know, go into depth on strawberries, but you were, you, you brought up the perfect point with strawberries. They're what we call mother plants. So if I plant, I come down here in two weeks and I buy my strawberries and I plant a patch, a pot, whatever it is. I've got three years and those plants are out of here. That doesn't mean you start over in three years. It means those mother plants, the original plants you put in are done. They're out of gas and they get pitched. So we pull mother plants out of our patch and we leave the runners and the young ones. So if you do this once a year, I do mine every, once a season right here, late winter, pull the oldest ones out. I can sometimes even divide them and replant those if you want but we want to remove those old mother plants after three years and keep the fresh running ones coming through. And what's your opinion, the best way to grow them? Um, Cause you can do them in pots, you can do them in the ground. Does it matter? Do you have a preference? I've got a little bowl to be honest with you. Um, I took most of mine out of the ground and I went more of those pocket pots. I found some beautiful big glazed ones 
Um, it's probably for me more about my two young sons. They like running around the front yard and I see them run over there and just grab a strawberry that's hanging out of the container all summer long. So that's kind of for me. Um, I don't know that it's any easier the ground versus the container per se, but the container, you know, I'm a kind of an OCD tidy guy and the container keeps them a little bit more tidy. If I do them on the ground, you know, maybe I got to worry a little bit more about slugs and debris and cleaning some things up as we go through the season, which isn't the end of the world and it's not super time consuming, um, but just, just something to keep in mind. And somebody's asking, have you ever heard of food grade growing containers? I mean, I guess for me, the, the bigger question is, you know, do we have to be concerned about what we're growing our edibles in, you know, treated wood, that kind of thing? Well, treated wood now is fine. That's it's all copper based. It has no arsenic or poisons like it did, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So I'm fine with treated wood. Um, you know, I, you'd have to look at the specific plastic. Um, that's why I would not per se go the plastic route. I think they fade, they crack, they don't last long anyway, but we would want to stay away from BPA and some of the issues that we've had with plastics. Um, that would be probably mine. If I saw a plastic pot, I'd look at the label. Thanks to the state of California, they pretty much have a label on anything plastic period that says this product is known to contain things that may cause this, this, and this. And then, okay, I don't want to eat that. So let's stay away from those. Excellent. Um, we get this question all the time, you know, in terms of using what you have around the house and uh, coffee grounds comes up a lot. Yep. Can we use that um, with it's, our, it's a, to help our soil? It's a never ending question. Everybody loves coffee up here, except me. I'm not a coffee guy, but, but uh, you can use your coffee grounds. Just don't, I, I just, I, I'd say this, don't think that that's some, you know, miracle solution to your soil acidity and fertilizer and all the rest. It is not a substitute for any of that. If you put fresh coffee out there, now we're going to be acidic, but I'm assuming you're not going to waste your $8 a pound Starbucks coffee grounds on fertilizing your blueberry. You're going to take the ones that are used and spent and wet. So use them out there. I, I don't have a problem in the yard. It's not going to hurt anything, but it doesn't, act as a substitute for the roadie food as fertilizer or frankly checking my soil pH to make sure I'm acidic enough to grow blueberries and in, in, for instance. Gotcha. Um, so somebody's asking about the black nursery pots. Um, are those okay for like berries and food and edible plants? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we grow, that's what we grow all ours in. Um, and typically that's what, that's, well, that's what I was talking about when we kind of played around I think when raspberry shortcake came out, um, I know Steve probably would say the same thing. We we're kind of like, really? A little dwarf raspberry, no thorns? I don't know how that's going to do. So we threw one in a pot, you know, and grew it ourselves. And it did really well here as kind of a demo plant. It just being a raspberry grows so much root system that we had to, you know, every three, four years, take it out, divide it and replant it, which is fine. You'll get some more plants out of the deal. Um, but certainly a you know, if, if you don't, you know, that the, the, the 15 gallon or 10 gallon, you know, that could be a, a kind of a temporary solution for some of the containers as well. Cool. Um, it seems like we covered everything. There's been a ton of questions and a lot of information that you've given us, which is always so wonderful. Um, and I know that I try and absorb as much as possible. Sometimes it takes round two to really get everything to sink in. Um, so it's, you know, why we record these class for lots of reasons. Um, it'll be up on YouTube here in a few hours. It'll be up on the website later today too. That way um, you can go back. I know people have been asking about the slides. They're not a separate file, but they are part of the recording. So you can go back through and watch it, um, pause it, kind of write down the varieties that jump out to you. Same thing with the website. It's a great way to go through and kind of see what they look like and see some of their different characteristics before coming down and just looking at the plants because they all kind of look a little bit the same right now, although they won't be the same. They look kind of similar. So, so take a look at things, um, you know, and come down. Like Trevor said, it's a beautiful day. It's a great day to be outside. So hopefully we'll see some of you around the nursery. Um, I appreciate all of you for your correct answer of pink for what other color are the berries. I got it. Everybody. Um, and I notified the, um, the winners. So uh, Sherry, Jesse, Carol, Jamie, and Nancy, congratulations. Um, I notified those people individually if they were the winner that a gift card will be waiting. If you didn't win this time, we apologize. Um, but better luck next time. We're doing this once a month. So there will be more chances to win, um, you know, 
well, March, which is almost here around the corner. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. We hope that we'll see you again tomorrow for roses, one of Trevor's favorite subjects um, and timely for Valentine's Day as well. Although there's lots of other great plant options um, for Valentine's Day, think outside of the box, but roses are always fun. So we'll hope we'll see you tomorrow as well. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you down here in the sun today and we'll see you for roses tomorrow. <laughs>